Good evening and welcome. My name is Brian Blake. I'm the superintendent of schools here in Ipswich, and I wanted to take a moment to welcome all of you and thank you for coming out for um, what I anticipate is a, a critical conversation for all of us. Um, certainly, uh, we know that we have some issues in our local community and surrounding communities that, that we've, uh, we've got to address and continue to work on. Um, this, evening, uh, this evening is being sponsored by Ipswich Aware, Ipswich is Aware is a multidisciplinary collaborative that's designed to promote community awareness, education, and prevention of substance abuse in the town of Ipswich. And we thank them for sponsoring this evening. Dr. Ruth Poti is a board certified family physician and addiction medicine physician at Valley Medical Group in Greenfield, Mass. She attended Wellesley College, Yale University School of Medicine, and did her residency at Boston University, where she remained as an assistant professor of family medicine for eight years. In addition to practicing full scope family medicine, she's currently the medical director for the Franklin County House of Corrections, the Franklin Recovery and Treatment Center, and the Pioneer Valley Regional School District, as well as the chair of the Healthcare Solutions of the Opioid Task Force of Franklin County. I would like to introduce and welcome Dr. Ruth Poti. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you. Thank, thanks, everyone, for coming out. That seems loud. Does it seem a little loud to you guys? Is it okay? Ti okay, sound-wise. Um, this is uh, Ipswich is beautiful. I love being here. I ran a half marathon several times up in this area, and as I was driving here, I was like, "Oh my God, I remember this part. I had a Charlie horse. I wanted to stop. Like I had a lot of." <laughs> negative and positive flashbacks of my commute here. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the brain and how it develops and we're gonna be very big picture about addiction. I think people come here and they think I'm gonna talk about heroin all night. I eventually talk about opiates, but I get there um, after a while, but really this is a talk about what happens to us that might create addiction, but actually how to protect our kids from developing the disease of addiction. We're gonna to have tons of times for questions at the end, so jot down what you wanna ask. If there's something you don't understand, obviously put your hand up, but I, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. This slide deck is available to anybody who wants it. The school has it, or actually um, the Ipswich um, Aware group has it. So you could put your name maybe on an email list in the back. I'm sort of gonna look at somebody to nod their head at me, and, and it will be emailed to you. Who's my magic person? There it is, I knew you would you'd take care of it. Um, so they have it, anybody can take it. You can go give this talk wherever you want. I don't care, you don't need to cite me, you can use it in any way that you like, okay? So we're gonna talk about the amazing human brain um, and we're gonna specifically focus on the reward circuit of the brain. The nucleus accumbens, the prefrontal cortex, and the ventral tegmental area. And this part of the brain is the part of the brain that tells you to survive. It tells you to find food, it tells you to find water, and it tells you to find a mate to send your genetic material forward. Because the entire purpose of you being on this planet is to survive long enough to send your genetic material forward. Now most of us don't think of ourselves that way, right? Nobody else got up this morning thinking that way. Most of us got up and thought, I have to go to work, I have to get my kids out the door, I gotta walk the dog. But from a deep evolutionary standpoint, your job is to survive long enough to send the genetics forward so the next several generations can succeed you. And this part of the brain is that, that is the part that governs this, and it is the part that breaks down with all addiction. So we think of this as the eat, drink, have sex, and sadly, use drugs part of the brain. It is the most ancient part of the brain. Every mammal in the universe has a brain that looks like this, okay? Um, and if we could pick up addiction and move it to the visual cortex or the auditory cortex of the brain, and you just lost your peripheral vision when you got addicted to something, it would be really easy to fix, right? I'd be like, you can't drive at night, you can't play baseball, wear your goggles playing field hockey, and you're all good, right? And instead, the part of the brain that has to do with should I live or should I die today is the part that gets impacted with addiction, why it, which is why it is such a difficult disease to treat. Uh, so 
The neurotransmitter that interacts with this reward circuit of the brain is dopamine. Lots of you know all about dopamine. It gives you this incredible sense of joy, of euphoria, of holy smokes, that was awesome, let's do it again. That's what dopamine does to your brain. That was awesome, you need to repeat that behavior in order to survive. So living in an Ipswich 200 years ago, you were really pumped when you found that great clam flat, right? When you uh, were able to kill a deer. I saw like 10 deer as I was driving. You guys have a big deer problem here, right? Holy smokes, there's a lot of deer. But anyway, 200 years ago, I imagine there were a lot of deer as well. And when you killed that giant stag and you were able to feed your family for another four days, you got a spike in dopamine. Your brain said that was awesome. That is behavior you need to continue. Next week, let's do the same thing over again, okay? So you get a spike in dopamine that gives you the strong sense of um, reward. It has with it two behaviors associated with dopamine. One is called perseveration, and the other one is compulsivity, compulsiveness. So perseveration is my mind cannot stop thinking about it. I need to think about how I'm gonna feed my family tomorrow because I need to keep my young people alive. Tomorrow morning, I need to get up extra early and I need to be the first one in my community to go out and kill the deer, right? That's my job, right? And your ancestors were fabulous at perseveration and compulsivity, right? My front row here, they weren't so good. They don't exist anymore because their ancestors were neither compulsive nor were they good perseverators. Your ancestors had this behavior deeply embedded in them. It's why we all exist is they did a great job with survival. But take those two behaviors and apply them to addiction. So who in this room is a nurse or works in a medical field or, so you guys know what it's like to be in the emergency room where the same person walks in the fourth time that month with an alcohol use disorder, right? And you're like, dude, seriously, I just saw you here a week ago. I know you're struggling with alcohol. You need to get better. You need to get fixed. You're in here, you're drunk, you're falling down. What is up with you? Like pull yourself up by the bootstraps and fix it, right? But instead, if you take a breath and take a step back and remind yourself, Compulsive use, perseverating behavior, it's what defines addiction. People cannot help themselves. Their brain literally is running in a cycle that says you must continue in order to survive. It's a terrible cycle. So I make an argument during this talk that at a baseline in this room, we all have about 100 units of dopamine, right? And there's some of us that are happy-go-lucky, silver lining on every dark cloud, golden retrievers of the world, and our baseline dopamine may be 105. We just, genetically, we got it, okay? There's a lot of us that look a lot more like this, where you know we're sort of the Eeyores of the world, the sort of dyslimic, low energy, um, low <laughs> dopamine people. And maybe the baseline dopamine on this character behind me is an 85 or something, okay? So first of all, don't call your family doctor tomorrow and ask for your dopamine level. It's not really a test that exists. They'll think you're a lunatic. But when you're thinking about a baseline dopamine of 100, and that's normal, and you kill that beautiful stag and are able to feed your family, you get a bump in your dopamine to 150, and then it goes back to normal. You have sex, it's consensual, you have an orgasm, your dopamine spikes to 200, and then it goes back to normal. This is a brain that is consistent with survival. You use a drug like cocaine and your dopamine will spike to 350. You use a drug like a strong prescription opiate, heroin, or fentanyl these days, and your dopamine will spike between 500 and 900. And when you use a drug like crystal methamphetamine, your dopamine will go to about 1300. So what's amazing to me is that more of us don't wake up every morning and decide we're gonna take a hit of crystal meth because it seems like a dopamine that high would be really a great idea, right? It seems that way. So let's talk about dopamine again in the brain. There's three things that govern dopamine, okay? There's how much dopamine is produced, how many receptors are on the other side of the synaptic cleft receiving the information, and how many little vacuums are sucking dopamine out of the active part of the brain. And I'm gonna tell you very quickly about two drugs and how they work specifically. Cocaine works specifically by turning off the vacuums. That's, it's a, Fastest mechanism of action is the easiest one to understand. It turns off the vacuum, and when the vacuum is turned off, you build up dopamine in the cleft to 350. The way that the opiates work is a little more complicated because it goes through a negative feedback loop through the GABA receptor. But at the end of the day, all the opiates just produce more dopamine. So the problem is, is that when the brain is used to the last 200,000 years that we have existed in this human form on this planet, the brain is used to seeing spikes of 150 or 200. But when the brain starts seeing spikes of 300, 500, 900, the brain says, holy smokes, there's something wrong here. 
there's something that's gone awry in my brain and I need to turn down the volume. I need to downregulate. I need to stop making dopamine. I need to erase 70% of my dopamine receptors on the other side and I need to turn on every vacuum in sight because there's something wrong in my brain. So people who have developed an addiction over a period of weeks or months wake up in the morning and their new dopamine set point is no longer 100 or 85. They wake up in the morning and their new dopamine is a 40. And it is hard to get out of bed, it is hard to shower, it's hard to take care of your children or be nice to your pet, it's hard to call my office and be nice to my office staff, it's hard to function in any normal way with any normal human relationship when your dopamine level's at 40. It's a level that's not really consistent with living, right? You're, you're breathing fine, you're still alive, but you're a little bit of a walking zombie. And the reason that people continue their use, right? One is to, to thwart the effects of withdrawal, but they continue their use because they're desperate to spike their dopamine back up to normal. They're desperate to get to 80 or 85 again. And the continued use is just to have the feeling of normalcy again, because no one can function at the level of 40. So the reason we don't get up in the morning and use a drug like crystal meth if, if we're doing fairly well in our lives is because a lot of us have this experience or just sort of this innate knowledge that you're gonna break your brain, right? And this is the concept that I share with you guys is that this is not a weakness of character. You were raised by bad people. You grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. Any one of us in this room, in my experience, given the right set of circumstance, could develop an addiction. Um, the front page of my local paper today was of my very brave police chief who came out talking about his own personal struggle with an opiate addiction. And it was the first time it had gone public and I'm incredibly proud of this guy who is incredibly courageous because it's really hard to tell people that you struggle with addiction because all of us have so much judgment about it. But it's a rare family these days that doesn't have somebody who struggles. And if you just stop and take a breath and acknowledge what happened in your own family tree, most of us have people who struggled. So this happened, and um, I meant to ask this question earlier. Your local hospital, there's a hospital in Gloucester, right? Is that the closest one that you guys might go to, to an ER? Beverly, okay could take my pick here. I'm going to go for Beverly here. So at, in Beverly Hospital, and I guarantee you this happened this week in Beverly, and I, it's not that I'm going after Beverly Hospital. I could say this about every single hospital in the country. This man who lives in Georgetown is the 68-year-old guy that you see in the upper left, and he is having crushing substernal chest pain at home. And his wife looks at him and says, honey, you don't look so good. And he says, no, 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 it's all good. It's just a little indigestion. And she says, I'm calling 911. And EMS and police and fire probably all arrive about the same time, and they take a look at this guy. He's blue around the lips. He looks terrible. They put some oxygen on his nose. They give him a sublingual nitroglycerin. They give him a beta blocker and a baby aspirin. They put in a big bore IV, and they put EKG leads on him, which they transmit to Beverly Hospital, and Beverly Hospital says, do not send him to us. This guy is having a massive interior wall MI. We don't want him. Let's med flight him or put him in the truck and get him straight down to the Mass General or to the Leahy, get him out of here, right? So this guy ends up at the Mass General Hospital ER. He's immediately brought to the cath lab. They say he's out of here at the cath lab. They bring him to the operating room where he has quadruple bypass surgery. He's then on the cardiac care unit for another four or five days, and then he's on the med surge floor in Telly for another week. He gets a social work consult because he's going to be depressed because all men get depressed after their heart attacks. He gets to see me, his primary care doctor. He gets a new cardiology appointment. He gets to go to cardiac rehab. How much money we just spend on him? Yeah, I think a couple hundred thousand, a quarter million. Boy, you guys named those numbers. We just sent him to man's greatest hospital. It cost a chunk of change is what I will say, right? MGH, anything in Boston is extra. It's, there's an extra price tag for you coming to Boston. So his next door neighbor in Georgetown is that 24 year old woman, woman lying on the ground. And she is seen in the Beverly Hospital emergency room as well the same week. Her mom finds the bathroom door locked, pounds on it because she knows her daughter has an opiate use disorder and there's no response. The door is locked, she kicks it in with an adrenaline surge and finds her daughter blue lying on the ground and not breathing. She calls 911 first and then administers Narcan but her daughter doesn't come back. EMS, the local police arrive and they administer three more vial of, vials of naloxone which is the opiate reversal drug before she comes to again. They bring her, slightly against her will, to Beverly Hospital. And what do we provide her there? 
Somebody said nothing. Somebody said a 24-hour observation, right, which is the new rule, right? What did somebody else say? A recovery coach might come down. Would that come to Beverly's ER? Awesome. So a recovery coach is a great thing that would happen in some of the more forward-thinking emergency rooms. Somebody who's often a peer, who's been in recovery, whose job it is to sit with you in this very low moment and say, what can I do to help you? Having said that, I have basically either a fairly lowly paid or volunteer person who shows up in an emergency room, right? And that's the best I offer this young woman. And the likelihood of her actually getting treatment from that setting is pretty darn low. Let me tell you a little bit more about my 68-year-old guy from Georgetown, okay? He smokes a pack and a half every day. He kicks back a 12-pack of beer every day. He goes to McDonald's four times a week. I actually don't know him as my primary care patient because I saw him four years ago and said, dude, you have high blood pressure and you need to take these two medicines. He never picked them up. He never came back to see me again. Both of his parents had cardiovascular disease and in fact, his da dad died in his late 50s of a heart attack. Does that guy have addiction? Yep. What is he addicted to? Alcohol, cigarettes, probably fat and sugar, salt, sure. Did anybody wag their finger at him and say, you know what, my friend, you actually created your heart attack. Your behaviors caused you to have a massive heart attack because his behaviors did cause him to have a massive heart attack. I'm not saying that young people don't sometimes have heart attacks. They do, but it's rare. But smoking and drinking and eating badly and not managing your high blood pressure, I can pretty much guarantee you're gonna have some serious cardiovascular disease. But nobody wagged their finger at him and said, you know what, I'm actually not gonna provide the best level of care possible. I'm not gonna do that. In fact, I may not even die, decide to transport you to the hospital today. I may leave you there to die because I'm really, really um, feeling very badly about the decisions you've made in life. And probably you don't deserve today's highest level of care provided at man's greatest hospital. I'm gonna choose not to provide your care. Do we do that to people? We take all comers, right? We take all comers regardless of their health, regardless of what role that they play in their health. Because guess what? Who in this room is perfect? Do I have like marathon running vegans in this room somewhere? Where is that person, right? None of us are perfect, right? All of us do behaviors that aren't so good. I ate the worst food. My Thursday nights, I drive, I've been working all week, I've been working all day, and I eat junk in my car just to like stay awake because I didn't have time to eat anything better. My point is, is that none of us make the perfect health decisions. We do the best we can, yet we provide the highest level of medical care for everybody, everybody, with the exception of people with addiction. We just don't do it. We judge them. We don't like them in our emergency rooms. We don't like them in our offices. How many of you have a primary care doctor that you know actively takes care of people with addiction? You do, awesome. That's great, I'm glad to hear that. You know, next time you go see your primary care doctor, you should ask them, what do you do with people with addiction? Do you help them? Do you know how to help figure out who they are? What care do you provide them? Because you know what's gonna change things? It's people like you from the ground up that make change happen. When I went to medical school, when I did my residency, we learned almost nothing about addiction. And when I came to my current practice and said, who's taking care of people with addiction? They were like, I don't know, not our problem. And I was like, oh yeah, it's our problem. But it took me eight years to get the behaviors there to change. So let's go back and talk about dopamine. That column in the middle is a healthy brain. These are PET scans on brains. And the column that's on the right are brains of people who struggle with addiction. And that first brain is somebody who struggles with cocaine. The next one down is somebody who struggles with crystal meth. The third one down is alcohol, and the final one down is heroin. And I like this slide because it does um, exhibit that I didn't make up the whole dopamine story. Those orange areas are active dopamine. In that middle column, there's lots of nice dopamine. In the right column, there's very little dopamine. The exception being alcohol. Alcohol affects the GABA system in the brain, eventually it hits the dopamine system, but the wheels fall off the alcohol bus pretty late in the game. There are a lot of us who are functional alcoholics, right? We drink way too much, we self-medicate with alcohol, we have a hard time stopping, yet we manage to go to work most days, we manage to keep our family roughly together. It takes a while before you've gotten your second OUI and your husband has walked out on you and your job says you're not performing up to stuff, snuff. So, the point of that picture is to remind us that alcohol, which I'm gonna talk about soon, is actually a really damaging legal um, substance in our society and causes a devastating um, harm to many people, including family members of probably a lot of us in this room. So there are three things that are going to set you up to develop addiction. And the first one is genetics. 
The second one is early exposure while the brain is developing. And the third one is a history of childhood trauma. The fourth one is not really the fourth one. The fourth one is poor mental health. And because you have poor mental health, anxiety, depression, um, a, another mood disorder as a teenager, that doesn't mean that you are gonna become an, an addict, right? It does mean that if you're 14 and you're just filled with terrible anxiety, and the one thing that helps you with your anxiety is when you drink, you become funny. When you drink, you fit in with your friends, right? It's not that the anxiety caused the addiction. It's that sometimes with mental health disorders, you expose your brain to an addictive substance early, whether it's alcohol or marijuana. And then that becomes the early exposure while the brain is developing, okay? But poor mental health can be a subcomponent of every one of those three things. So let's talk about the genetics of addiction. It is hard to find any disease that has more genetic um, predilection than addiction does. If you have a parent or a grandparent who struggles with addiction, you have about a 50% chance of developing addiction yourself. So who needs to hear that piece of information? Your kids. And you know who I have in this room? I actually have kids in this room. Not tons, but I actually have four or five or six, and I'm really glad you guys are here. Um, I love when kids come to this talk, because this talk is at your kid's level. It's not above any kid's level. And um, your kids need to know this piece of information, not because they get to change their genetics. They need to know this because they get to impact the next thing 100%, so much so that they can almost erase their genetics. Here I am describing a disease with this much genetic um, background when most diseases actually don't. People come in, they're like, my great grandmother had colon cancer and then my father had this. And I, I'm like, okay, wait, back up, back up, back up, right? First of all, most cancers are not that genetic. You have a BRCA gene, right, for ovarian or breast cancer, that's genetic. I'm gonna nod my head fiercely on that. But a lot of cancers arise de novo from nothing, unpredictable. And a lot of cancers have to do with environmental impact, right? The number one killer in our society is tobacco use. By far and large, it's the number one killer. And so when people tell me my dad died of cancer, I say, did he smoke? And they say, yes, he did. And I said, the likelihood of you having that kind of cancer as a non-smoker has just plummeted, right? But genetics, that is not true for when it comes to addiction. So when I sat down with my three kids, I said, we have a very strong family history of addiction, and the three of you are at high risk. You don't get to control your genetics. You get what you get. But you get to control this next thing 100% which is when it is you expose your developing brain to an addictive substance. So when you sit down with somebody who struggles with addiction, and I ask this question every day, all day long, you ask the question, how old were you with your first addictive substance, whether it was marijuana, alcohol, or nicotine, how old were you when you first started using? And the average age of first use is? Yeah, 14, right? But it's actually really 12, 13, or 14 is the average age of first use of those substances. Okay, so I'm talking a sixth, seventh, or eighth grader, right? So this is not a conversation you have for the first time in 10th grade, right? Horse out of the barn. This is a fifth grade beginning conversation that you repeat again and again, right? So the conversation is, while your brain is developing, exposure to any addictive substances, and again, the three most common, alcohol, marijuana, and in the old days, nicotine, right? We all grew up in households where people smoked, where parents and grandparents left their lit cigarette in a glass ashtray, you remember those days? That's where people, kids would go up and be like, woo, they're in, right? It's actually really hard for kids to get cigarettes these days. One, most of us don't smoke anymore. The numbers of American smokers have plummeted. It's a huge public health success story. Um, but we're gonna talk a little bit about e-cigarettes, right, which are found in this school because lots of our kids are using these flavored e-cigarettes because they think they taste good, but lo and behold, they have nicotine in them, right? So you've just created somebody with an addiction to nicotine, which wasn't the point. So if you are a 15-year-old kid and you start drinking, and drinking here is defined as two alcoholic beverages a week, 40% of those 15-year-olds go on to be alcoholics. If you wait until age 21 to expose your brain to alcohol, then 7% go on to be alcoholics. 40% versus 7%. The rates of alcohol misuse in this country are 13% right now. They've never been higher, and it's, we're gonna talk about why that is. But some, the point is, is that if you wait till 21, the rates of alcoholism go down to 7%. So what do you say to your child or to your grandchild where there is a strong family history of addiction? 
You say what I say to my own kids. You need to postpone use as long as possible. I don't ever want you using heroin. I don't ever want you using nicotine products because they're terrible for you. But you need to delay your use of alcohol as long as possible. It's not just because it's the law that the age is 21. It's because the longer you wait, the more likely it is that your brain will develop well and you will ne never develop addiction. If you wait until after the age of 22 to expose your brain, even with a strong genetic risk, you almost entirely cancel out the genetics. You don't ever get to do that with any disease that you can cancel out the genetics, but with addiction you can. And that's amazing, and that's why you need to talk to your kids on this subject, okay? They should be teaching this in the schools, right? This is a health class conversation. This is why I'm like, take my slides and use them. Use them in any class you want. This is a conversation that school resource officers have with kids, right? Because this stuff matters. And it's one of the reasons I love school resource officers, because they're often in the ditches with the kids who are the highest risk. They know. OK, so our kids have never made um, better decisions about substances in generations um, than this generation right now. They're making awesome decisions uh, on everything. They drink less than our older generations used to. They smoke cigarettes way, way less. Um, the problem is, is that as cigarettes have gone down, the marijuana use has gone up. And that is because the sense of risk has changed. So if I ask the average 14-year-old, do you smoke cigarettes? They're like, of course I don't smoke cigarettes, right? And I'm like, oh, why is that? And they're like, because they're going to kill me. They're horrible. They age my skin. They're disgusting. They're... Most teenagers are disgusted by cigarettes. Do you guys remember having your toddlers in the car? And they'd be like, mommy, somebody's smoking, right? They'd like shout it out. And you'd be like, honey, it's OK. Like, it's not actually against the law to smoke. It's not good for you. But they don't need to be arrested because they smoke cigarettes. But they had that sense, right? It's gotten drilled into them. But that's because the sense of harm with nicotine has gone way up, so the use has gone down. But the sense of harm with marijuana, there's no harm with marijuana, right? What do teenagers say about marijuana these days? It's medicinal. It helps me sleep. It helps my anxiety. It cures cancer. What else? It's legal. It's legal. That one's true. That is a fact. I'm going to not argue that one. What else? Natural. It's natural. It's organic. It grows in the ground. I'm not buying it by the pharmaceutical industry. Yep. It helps athletic performance. That one kills me, actually. But yes, I've heard that one too. Yeah. Or it helps me drive better. I get that one all the time. I'm a better driver because of it. It's not addictive. I won't get addictive on it. addicted on it. What else? It's not a gateway drug. Its use will not promote. So you guys, you don't know this, but I'm, I'm being um, facetious with everyone with the exception of the legal part of it, OK? Because this is what the average adolescent, anybody up to the age 25, this is what they say. And they, it's not just what they say. The deep belief is that this stuff is all good, that there's really no harm, and that it's been oversold as harmful. And I definitely want to answer questions when it comes to marijuana. Did you have another one to add? Yep. Oh, yeah. There are lots of communities out there where the adults are saying, this is a great uh, product, and actually, I'm going to make sure that my kids have access to it. Absolutely. There's lots of adults who think it's really, really good. So we're going to talk about marijuana, and I'm going to say something just at the outset. Um, I actually do not think that marijuana is more harmful than alcohol. I don't, particularly once the brain is fully developed. What you do over the age of 25 with marijuana, as long as you don't put anybody else in harm's way, I actually do not care, right? If you are 28 years old and you're smoking pot in your basement, I don't care. I don't want you on the roads. I don't want you operating on my knee. I don't want you changing lug nuts on my tires. Like, stay at your house and do what you're going to do, right? I do not believe it is more harmful than alcohol once the brain is developed. But while the brain is developing, it is absolutely a neurotoxic drug. And no one is going to convince me out of that. And I think what we don't know about marijuana at this point is far greater than what we actually think we know. And I think in the next 20 years, as this story unravels, we are going to regret that we dove in sort of head first into the world of industrialized marijuana that has now taken over the tobacco industry. So let's talk about marijuana. You guys are going to be sick of this soon, but um, I need you to understand uh, the way marijuana affects the brain. So there's three things that happen in this middle school and high school every single day. Your brain is as big as it's going to be by the age of two, right? That big, giant two-year-old toddler head, that's it. That's as big as your brain gets. And when you get to be 25, your brain is all about degeneration, right? It's not growing anymore. It's not 
um, it's not making new connections anymore, it's starting to deteriorate. And for those of us in the room that feel like we have a deteriorating brain, you know what I'm talking about. But between the ages of 12 and 24, three incredibly critical things happen. And the first one is called synaptic refinement. You have billions and billions of connections between your brain in adolescence, billions of them. You don't need that many. And in fact, having that giant tangled mess of adolescent brain is not a good thing. The adolescent's job is to prune it back. Their job is to snip back the uh, unhelpful parts of these synaptic connections and leave themselves with a nicely ordered brain. And so for those of us who are parenting teenagers, which is a lot of you, right? A lot of us are parenting teenagers in the room, right? These brains are amazing and they're doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing and they're really maddening sometimes to parent or to teach or to coach. But these brains that are trying to prune back these unhelpful um, connections are trying to push the limits all the time. So the second thing that's happening during adolescence is myelination, which is when they are sheathing rapid pathways in the brain. So they're getting rid of the dusty country roads that they're never going to use anymore, and they're making good super highways in the brain of, of useful paths. So this high-risk behavior is normal development. It's all act first and think later, more risky impulsive behaviors, less than optimal planning, less consideration for negative consequences, a very strong focus on the physical sensation seeking. Um, emotions are felt very intensely. Anybody have a teenage girl? Right? Like my daughter is saying, I love you, mom, you're the best. And literally 11 seconds later, she is screaming at me and crying. And I literally have not said anything. I've just, I just walked in the door. Nothing is, there's been no communication except that emotional valence in teenage years is incredible, right? And this is lovely and it is normal and it's the way it's supposed to be because these brains are trying to figure out what needs to go and what gets kept, okay? They're amazing brains. And our job as adults and teachers and superintendents and school resource officers is to throw as many positive things we can at them and to try to keep them out of as many risky situations as possible because you want the right stuff to stay and you want to get rid of the stuff that's not necessary. This is a really critical brain formation time, and it's the only time it happens, OK? Um, there's never a time in your life when you are more influenced by your peers, ever. And I want you to pause with me on that. When you were seven, you're on the playground, and one of your friends said, let's do this really stupid or mean thing, you were like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go tell the teacher because that seems bad, right? And your instinct is to do the right thing. And when you're 27 and one of your goofball friends let's, says, let's go do the stupid thing, you're like, dude, you're an idiot. I'm not going to go do that. But when you're 15 and somebody says, let's go do this terrible or stupid thing, you're like, I'm in, right? Like, that's a great plan. I'm in. Because this age, right, think about it evolutionarily speaking, you have been thrust out of the cave or wherever you're living, you're basically on your own by adolescence because nobody wants to keep those adolescents around, you're looking for your mate, you're looking for your herd. That is why your friends, your kids' friends, your kids' peers matter so much and it's why you kind of need to keep track, right? Like you can't be the kind of parent that says, yeah, go hang out with whoever you want. I don't know whose house you're spending at, but it's all good, right? Like my kid's spending the night tomorrow night. I know the girl, she's lovely. I actually don't know her parents and I don't know where they live. And I said to my daughter last night, I said, I need their number. I need to call them. I need to introduce myself to them. They need to know who I am. I need to know who they are. And I said, that is normal, right? That's a normal thing to do. And she looked at me like I had three heads. And I was like, it's okay, just get me their number. And very reasonable, right? Nobody, nobody here thought that was unreasonable. Okay, so three things that happen during that time, again, the myelination and the synaptic refinement. The third one is the laying down of the final receptors in the brain. So the final receptors that get laid down are twofold. The first one is dopamine. This is the reason why all addiction starts while the brain is developing, is the final dopamine receptors get laid down in the outer shell of the brain. It happens between the ages of 12 and 24. The second set of receptors that get laid down and get activated are receptors called anandamide. And anandamide are naturally occurring endocannabinoid receptors. And these are the receptors that we think helps make the decision about what gets kept and what gets pruned away. And the problem is that THC, which is the psychoactive cannabinoid in marijuana, 
It looks exactly like anandamine to the brain. They're mirror images of each other. And so the way the brain sees anandamide is that it sees it the same way as marijuana, but marijuana is much more like a sledgehammer than a scalpel when making the decision about what gets cut and what gets saved. So it's a real problem, and it is the reason why I really believe that marijuana is a neurotoxic drug while the brain is developing. Your kids do not know this. Most of us didn't know this, right? A lot of us in this room may have voted for this ballot measure in November. People did not know this stuff. So what do we know about marijuana when you start using it as a teenager? It has effect on attention, verbal learning, memory, processing speed, and it stays with you even when you are not high. I like this slide because it makes it pretty clear, but I'm gonna compare the two extremes just to make the point. So this is looking at teenagers um, who used marijuana between the ages of 15 and 21. In that top gray line is teenagers who used marijuana zero times in their that six year span. And I'm gonna compare it to the red line. And these are kids who used marijuana 400 times or more between the ages of 15 and 21. And I wanna comment that 400 times in a six year span is not that much, right? We have kids who use marijuana every day. I have kids in my practice who wake up in the morning and they take a hit. They take a second hit in the school bathroom at 11. They take another hit at 2.30 in the afternoon. They smoke it before they sit down with their parents for dinner, and they smoke it to help them sleep at night, right? I just got five hits in a day. So it doesn't take much to get 400 hits within a six-year span of time, okay? So when you are somebody who used marijuana zero times, 30% of those kids graduate from college by age 25 compared to 2% of kids who used 400 times or more. When you look at unemployment rates, the unemployment rates for kids who use zero times by age 25 are 21%, compared to 52% of kids who use marijuana 400 times or more. So gray line versus red line, I'm just showing you the extremes. And then the final one, this is data that comes from Australia and New Zealand, where I think there's a bigger welfare state, but the percent of people on welfare by age 25, 57% of those kids with high use were on public assistance or welfare. So for me, this is a generation of failure to launch, right? These, I love my three kids. I want them out of my house. I want them to grow up. I want them to take care of their house and their community and pay taxes. I don't want them living with me. But when I have kids who are actively using marijuana day after day, right, that, that couch lock, that major, major description of, of I can't get off the couch and I'm just hanging out playing video games all day, that is a kid who's failing to launch out of your home, right? They're not actively engaged in community activity. They're not going to the police academy. They're not going off to university. Things are not going well for them. So this is the stuff that our kids need to understand about marijuana. Is it going to kill them, marijuana? Mm -mm. No, you don't, you don't overdose with marijuana. I never disagree with that. Have there been deaths associated with it? Very rarely. But um, exposure while the brain is developing can cause psychosis. The two or three deaths in Colorado in the last two years had to do with young people becoming psychotic and jumping off of buildings. Or in the case of a man who used, he became psychotic and actually shot his wife, who he loved greatly, but he was psychotic. So marijuana will not kill you. I'd never disagree with anybody on that front. So the other data, same studies, looks at IQ drop by age 35. There's an eight point drop in IQ. The problem with all the studies is it's based on the old marijuana. So the marijuana in the 70s and the 80s and 90s had THC levels between one and 3%. There's none of that marijuana left. You cannot find marijuana with a THC of 3% or less. Every field grown marijuana plant that's confiscated by the DEA in the country starts at 9%, goes up to about 16%, but it's just getting stronger and stronger. So if you think your brain was bad at 3% marijuana, 3% THC, what's it look like at 16%, right? It is not a positive chemical for brain development. And I just wanna point out, THC is the psychoactive cannabinoid in marijuana, the one that makes you wicked high. The other cannabinoids are the stuff that actually help with other things. Nausea, increasing appetite for people who have terrible um, cachexia with HIV or um, with cancer. It helps people with muscle spasticity and MS, stuff that actually I use medically. It's really quite helpful to me, but nobody's growing the good stuff that I need in medicine. They're growing the high stuff, okay? The other problem is that when you talk to kids about marijuana, this is what they know, right? If you show them a big fat rolled joint, most kids wouldn't even know what that is. They know the concentrates. So this is when you take the marijuana plant and you put in 
a soluble um, oil or gas through it, like butane, and that then does an extraction of the THC. And this stuff is ranging between 70 and 95% THC. You can smoke it, you can vape it, you can eat it in spaghetti sauce or milk or beer or ice cream or chocolate. Um, you can spread it on your skin as a cream. Lots of people use it as a tincture under the tongue. Marijuana comes in every imaginable form now, and it is coming to a local recreational pot store near you. And this, at this point, is what they will be selling. Because unless the Cannabinoid Commission comes out with some regulations about what they can and cannot sell, the ballot measure we passed in Massachusetts in November said you can have no limit on THC, you can go as high as you want, and you must sell edibles, and you can basically sell anything you want. And so this is what Colorado looks like. This stuff is marketed to children. It is sugar and fat mixed together in childlike candies. Those candy bars you're seeing have 12 servings of marijuana in them. So those Kit Kats, and pause for yourself the last time you shared a Kit Kat with 11 other people was never in your entire life did you do that. But that Kit Kat and that Nestle Crunch or whatever it's caused, called has 12 servings of marijuana in it. And the problem is that marijuana absorbed in the stomach is very slow with a very unpredictable um, onset of action. So people will take their one serving and half an hour later are like, I'm not feeling anything. So they break off a lot more and eat it, and six hours later, they're in the emergency room in Denver Hospital, completely, floridly psychotic, because they just consumed 12 servings of marijuana at 80% THC. But again, this is what we just voted on. We basically had the marijuana industry write the ballot measure, and we said, you can do whatever you want. So where's Ipswich with recreational marijuana? Did you guys vote for it? You think we did, okay. And the, so you can have a store here. In fact, you will have a store here unless the town council actively, actually, if you voted for it as a town, the town has to vote against it not to have a store, I think, are the regulations. So a store will be coming near you. In fact, five stores could be coming near you. Right? Yeah. Yep, completely. It, it is a quote unquote regulated industry but the amount of money that lobbyists for the marijuana industry um, spend is enormous. And so Colorado still has, this is candy that comes from Colorado. This is um, exactly what it will be looking like. Again, the Cannabinoid Commission got into place a month ago. They have until July to get it all together. You can imagine them saying we're gonna have a limit on THC. You can imagine them saying there should be a limit to everything that's sold, maybe the limit, I don't know, what's a reasonable number, guys, 40%? I mean, even that seems high to me, but it certainly shouldn't be 90%. It would be reasonable to say, if you're gonna have a candy bar, it should be one serving, right? That seems reasonable, right? And you should have very clearly on the back exactly how much THC is in there. Because I could tell you, it's not clear on this, right? And you could have some warning that says, by the way, this may take three to six hours to kick in, so don't keep auto-dosing yourself because you're gonna get really sick, right? You can imagine a public health response that's reasonable, right? This industry is designed to addict as many young people as possible. This is an industry, follow the money. They need to make money, my friends. Tobacco is going away. Tobacco industry needs a new economy, and it's marijuana, right? And in order for their business model to survive, it is based on the fact that people under the age of 25 must get addicted. So this is an industry that is after our kids. And I'm not, I'm not a paranoid person, but I believe in the, in the, I know what businesses do. And for those businesses whose job it is to addict anybody, right, the sugar industry, the tobacco industry, we've been through this before. We've watched this happen already. Um, this is a great article that covers this subject, and it says, in the year 1900, less than 1% of Americans smoked tobacco. And then the tobacco industry came into business, okay? And the first thing the tobacco industry did is they grew a more potent tobacco product. They grew bigger leaves with bigger veins because that's where the nicotine is. It's in the vein of the plant, right? And, I mean, tobacco's been here for thousands of years. Our native people used um, tobacco, but they used it very little, right? They used it for rituals once a week, once a month. They weren't smoking the equivalent of two packs a day. 
But then the tobacco industry came, and the first thing they did, a more potent plant, which we just saw with marijuana. And then they began putting it into different forms. They put it in with 300 other cancer-causing agents inside a thin paper-covered stick called a cigarette. And by the year 1950, in 1900, less than 1% 1 of Americans smoked. By the year 1950, 70% of American men were smoking. Right? The intention is to addict as many people as possible. And this old industry needs a new business plan. And guess who's going to feel the brunt of it? We are. And my sadness is, I think in 20 or 30 years, we're going to look at this and think, what the heck were we thinking? How is it that we sold this stuff to kids? Because it's intended for our kids. OK. <sighs> we're going to move away from marijuana. I got all hot and bothered up here. We're going to talk about alcohol. So one third of us in this country drink absolutely zero. One third of us in this country drink very lightly, a couple drinks a month, a drink a week, very light social drinkers. And the final one third of us drink all the rest of the alcohol. And in fact, the final 10% of us drink on average between nine and 10 drinks every single day, okay? Now, that's probably not most of you in this room because you would have already needed to start drinking by now, okay? But nine to 10 drinks a day, I think most of us would agree, is a lot of alcohol. The problem is it doesn't take that much to get there. So let's just remind ourselves what I'm talking about. It's a 12 ounce beer. I actually don't drink a normal 12 ounce beer. I'm an IPA hoppy girl, which means my alcohol tends to be closer to 6.9, sometimes 8%, which is about a drink and a half, right? So if you're drinking a craft beer, you're drinking more. You're drinking more of 1.5, right? When you're drinking um, hard liquor, it's 1.5 ounces of, of liquor. If you're, anybody in this room a bartender? Has anybody worked as a bartender? No? So you make a mixed drink, and quite honestly, by the time you pour it all in there, it's really most cocktails have two or three equivalents of alcohol in them. So they add up fast. And the serving of wine is five ounces. That is what counts as a, as a serving of alcohol when it comes to a public health um, evaluation of drinking. So every day I take care of patients. All day long it's what I do. And I take care of healthy and unhealthy babies and really old people. And every day I ask the question, tell me about your relationship to alcohol. And women will say to me, oh, you know, I have a couple drinks at night. And I'm like, oh, yeah, what are you drinking? And they say, you know, I have some wine. And I'm like, so how much are you pouring in your wine goblet? Because many of us are drinking out of these giant wine goblets, right? And they're like, I don't know. I just pour. I pour and I pour and I pour, right? That's what they really are doing. And I say to them, you need to know what you're drinking. You need to put five ounces of some beverage into your wine glass and just acknowledge that's one serving. That's it. And a lot of us are serving ourselves 15 ounces of wine at night. It's very easy to do that, my friends, OK? And all I do is with my patients, I say, I'm not judging you. I just need you to acknowledge what you're really drinking, that your couple glasses at night is really the equivalent of six to seven to eight glasses of wine every night. And you need, to, you need to pause and ask yourself, why am I doing that? Because when your kids watch you walk in the door after a terrible day at work, and the first thing they see is you flip off the cap of a beer or you're uncorking a bottle of wine, the message our kids hear and see is when you're down, when you're overwhelmed, the solution to your problem is to drink. And instead, the modeling that we need to do as adults is to walk in the door and say, man, I had a terrible day at work. I'm going for a walk. Does anybody want to come with me? I'm going to go sit in the other room. I'm going to hit my app, my John Kabat-Zinn meditation app. I'm going to go sit down for 10 minutes, and I'm going to breathe and feel what it's like to be in my body right now. That's what I need to do right now. We need to start modeling for our kids healthy behaviors to manage stress and stress and anxiety. And many of us as adults do not do that. Many of us, of us, and I'm going to include me in this picture and many of us in this room, often turn to alcohol. Think about the last time you were at an adult party where alcohol was not a big part of the story. I was at a high school, I, I was saying this to the superintendent earlier, I was at a high school a week or so ago, and their rates of high school drinking were some of the highest I've ever seen in Massachusetts. I was a little stunned by it, and they were a little stunned how stunned I was. And I said, this is really not normal. This is way out of the range. And then they said, well, it's the parents. It's very normal to drink. And in fact, the parents will always tailgate at the, at the high school um, sporting events. So at a football game, at a soccer game, the parents are in the back of the car with their bumper down or whatever, and they're drinking. And I'm like, they're drinking on school property? I mean, I'm, I'm horrified. And I'm not, I'm not that boring and straight-edged a person. And they're like, yeah, that's normal behavior. 
Everybody has what they call the, um, the beer fridge in their garage. Everybody has that. And kids know if they want to drink, they just go to whoever's beer fridge in people's garages and help themselves. And I thought, that is crazy, right? That is a community where the norm is excess drinking and where the kids see that as normative behavior and they're starting drinking at a young age. My alcohol is under lock and key at my house. And when I put up that cabinet with the lock, the kids said to me, mom, what's up? You don't trust us? And I was like, no, I don't trust you, right? You're 13 and 15 and 17 years old. I should have probably put it under lock and key a lot earlier than this. I know what I did in the 1980s with alcohol, right? Because a lot of us did it. So if you love your kids and you want to make it a little harder for them to drink, lock your alcohol up. It should not be easy. And you certainly should not be having a beer fridge loaded with alcohol available to any neighborhood kid in your garage. I think that is an unbelievable situation, personally. OK, so there are two now we've covered things that are going to predispose you to addiction. The first one was genetics. The second one was early exposure while the brain was developing. I know you think I thought I forgot about my three little things. We're going to cover the third one. And that is the concept of something called adverse childhood experiences or having a high ACE score. Does anybody know about ACE scores in the room? A handful. Are you guys therapists? Yeah? No? But you're in the medical field that you know ACE scores is what I'll say. But you're a therapist, right? OK. So adverse childhood experiences is a measure of um, what might have happened to us as children at home that actually predisposes many of us to chronic disease. So I'm not going to go into the gory, gory details because I have kids in the room. But I'm going to tell you that in 1996, um, a study came out of San Diego County that asked 10 questions about what might have happened to you under the age of 18 at home. And these were things, I'm going to read some of the questions, but not all of them. Did a parent or another adult in the household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or hurt you, or act in a way that you thought you might be physically harmed? Were you ever sexually abused? Did you feel like no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special? Um, did you often or very often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, and had no one to protect you? Were your parents too um, high or too drunk to take you to the doctor if you were sick? Were your parents separated or divorced? Was there somebody in your household with a major mental illness? Um, was there somebody in your household who was incarcerated? You can Google an ACE score. You guys are going to take the slide deck and you can read it. It's 10 questions, yes or no. This is a measure of household dysfunction, abuse, and neglect. And um, what was not known about the study is that it would predict for every chronic disease out there. If you score a four or a high on an ACE score, you're much more likely to have a heart attack. You're much more likely to have every chronic disease, including COPD, asthma, multiple broken bones, um, than somebody who scores a one or a less. If you score a six or a higher on an ACE score, you're going to die 20 years earlier. So this concept of growing up in a household where you did not feel safe, where you f were actually abused, where your fight or flight response, your fear level was high all the time because you grew up in this really chaotic, neglectful house, it sets up a body where literally organs and cellular structure have been changed in a way that sets you up for chronic disease. And it is the biggest predictor for two chronic diseases. One is addiction. The second one is experiencing chronic pain. So our kids don't get to change their ACE scores. But for those of us in this room who are adults that love our kids, are teachers of our kids, are protectors of our kids, our job is to help protect our kids to have their numbers be as low as possible. I did an ACE score on a gentleman of mine. I've taken care of him forever. He has chronic pain. Um, and I never knew what his ACE score was. I usually get them on most of my patients because for me, it's like a vital sign. It tells me so much information. And um, he hasn't been able to work because he's disabled. And I gave him the ACE score, and he scored a 7 on a scoring system. That's really, I cry when I read the ACE score. I find it so, dis it's so upsetting to me. And a 7 is an appalling score, right? It means a lot of horrible things happened to you as a kid. And he sat there in the room with me, and he was weeping. And he was feeling bad about it, like it was any way his fault, right? ACE scores are never the kid's fault, ever. And I reminded him. That he's a great dad and he's a great husband, and that his children's ACE score was zero, right? I know his whole family. And I said, you have done something that's remarkable, which is you've stopped the generational spread of this kind of trauma, right? That is an amazing thing. Because if I told you the one thing you could do well in your life is you could protect your children from having bad things happen to them, most of us in this room as parents would do anything we could. So it was, I was uh, 
it was a really powerful moment between the two of us to acknowledge how well he has done as an adult. Okay, so three things, a high genetic risk, a history of childhood trauma, and early exposure while the brain is developing is the setup for addiction. And the message I send to you as community members is you need to talk to our young people. You need to talk to them early, and the message needs to be delay your use. Just delay your use, right? Not don't ever drink, it's gonna kill you. That's not a realistic message, and it's not true. Just delay as long as you can. When I sent my kid off to college, so I have three kids, I have one in college, two are in high school, and I sent him off to college. He knew this stuff. He's come to my talks. He helps me with my slides. The kid is, he knows the stuff. But I said, look, dude, I know you're going to drink. You're going to college. Like, I've been to college. I know, right? And he said, yeah, I probably will drink. He said, but I'm going to drink very carefully, and I'm going to drink very little. He was trained in first aid. He knew CPR, not because he's the son of a doctor, but because he cared about that stuff. Um, and his first night at college, he went to the emergency room. And I heard about it the week later. And I said, what was up? He said, well, I went to my first frat party and everybody was drunk. And in fact, once I got there, I realized I really couldn't drink because people around me were making such unsafe decisions that my job was to be the person, the, the bystander whose, whose job it was to look around and protect them. And the truth is everybody's kid in this room could have that job too. Right? Being an active bystander whose job it is is to help protect your peers who are making terrible decisions, your kids could be little knights in shining armor whose job it is is to make sure that that girl doesn't get hauled up that frat set of stairs in the back, right? That your buddy who's hanging all over that person is too drunk to be making any interaction with any person at this point. He needs to be removed from that situation. Because every attack, right, the attacker, the person being attacked is, is under the influence, right? And if you can prevent an assault, you have changed somebody's life. You've changed likely two people's life for the rest of their lives. So equipping your kids with a sense of responsibility, training them in CPR, basic life support, I think will make a difference for other kids and it will make a difference for them. So my kid spent five nights in the emergency room his first year of college because he brought down kids who were dropped down drunk to the ER. And his decision tree was like, am I calling 911 or am I calling Uber? Like, how am I getting this kid to the ER, right? That was his decision tree. And he, that's his role he's played. Last year, I got a text from him that said, I need Narcan. And I almost threw up. Like, you get a text from your kid that says they need Narcan. Like, nobody really wants that text to come. And I was like, dude, what is up? And he said, I have a big uh, it's spring weekend here. And we have kids who are actively using heroin in the dorm. He said, I just found that out. I need Narcan. I said, okay, I'll get you Narcan. And I had Narcan to him the next day. He didn't use it, but he's a kid who had a sense of his responsibilities to help protect other people. But your kids had that same sense too. You just have to arm with them with that, okay? Okay, so I said it to you before, our kids are making the best decisions about alcohol, about cigarettes, and about illicit drugs. This data goes back to 1995, but look at how the numbers have come down for drinking, for smoking, and for everything else. Our kids are actually doing an awesome job. The norm for our kids is to not be doing any of it. That's the norm, and we need to celebrate the norm with our kids, because you know what's not celebrated? That. And instead, you hear from the obnoxious kids who are smoking weed all weekend or at some football party on a Friday night and got drunk. They feel like they're the norm when you're in high school, but they're not. And boy, the norm kids, they love to hear it. They really do. They deserve to hear it. I'm speaking actually at Boxford High School tomorrow. I don't talk to high schools a lot because I have multiple jobs, but um, that's a tr tricky crowd, right? Get a whole high school of, uh, a whole auditorium with high school students. They do not want to hear that marijuana data. Right? It's a different talk I give them, but I give them that marijuana data and they don't believe me. But you know what? It's just the 10% in the back that don't believe me. The rest of the place believes it. So the difference with the tobacco use, it's that little red line. It's the e-cigarettes. So e-cigarettes have definitely been on the rise. Um, it's something like 35% of high school seniors now are using e-cigarettes. Your school resource officer in this school says they do find e-cigarettes, and you guys know this, but those things are not well regulated. We have no real idea what's in an e-cigarette. We definitely think formaldehyde and other preservatives are in it, but the problem is a lot of them have nicotine in it. So here you have a kid who's smoking their watermelon flavored something or other for some reason. They think it's all good. It's like, it's like chewing gum, but it isn't like chewing gum. It has nicotine in it, which means you just created a nicotine addiction, which is the last thing you needed, right? So I am never a fan of the e-cigarettes. Um, I am going to spend one slide just reminding us about really what the strongest addiction is for a lot of our kids these days, right? Does anybody have a glowing device in your kid's hand a lot of the time? 
Anybody struggling with parenting that? It's hard, right? Isn't it hard? Holy smokes. And they act like they're going to die when you take it away from them. And then in the argument, when you say you can't have it at night anymore, and they freak out, they're like, I'm not going to wake up. It's like they've never heard of an alarm clock. I mean, for generations, we've had alarm clocks. So this is a really hard thing. These smartphones, this is known as the I generation. Um, and the I generation is going to have its own set of issues. They have a higher rate of depression and anxiety and a much higher rate of not being able to connect to real human beings because so much of their time is spent connecting to people through a device that when they actually have to go somewhere and do this interaction, they're going to struggle. So this is the worst, this for me is the worst part of parenting right here. It's really, really hard. This is a great article that came out in, in August. Did anybody read this article? It's worth, so again, you're going to get the slide deck. You read the article, right? I thought it was an interesting article. We have no idea. Do you guys have any clue what your kids are doing? Most of us are clueless. Most of us have no idea even how to work what they're doing. It is, it's terrifying. There's a lot of trauma that's being, um, is occurring to our kids that we are unaware of. So getting control of this, we've got, we've, got to, we've got to start getting ahead. We are behind the curve big time. So this is a great article. And there's another great book I just started reading. I'll try to remember the title for you by the end, but I may not remember it. But so get this article. But you're going to get the slide deck, and you're going to read this article. OK, so remember I mentioned opiates to you, because everybody thinks that's why I'm here? Let's talk a little bit about opiates. So um, every morning, because I'm a family doctor, I get up and I read the obituaries of my local paper, because I take care of really old people that are going to die, right? That's my job. And I have to write, I have to fill out a death certificate, and I need to write or call the family and um, express my condolences. So every morning, I have that same routine. And in the December of 2012, I read the obituary of that young woman on the top left in the city year jacket, and it read, Ashley Sims, age 21, died of a heroin overdose at home. And I thought, oh my God, Ashley died. And I called her grandmothers who I knew to tell them how sad I was about her death and to thank them for telling the truth about how Ashley had died. Because for years I'd been reading about young people dying at home unanticipated. And there's really very few reasons that happens. It's either an overdose or it's a suicide. Unless it says at the bottom, please give money to Dana-Farber or the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, unanticipated deaths of young people, as far as I'm concerned, are suicides or overdoses. And these grandparents, these two grandmothers who raised that little girl, went to the local newspaper and said, do not let Ashley's death go in vain. Please tell the story about what is happening in our community in Franklin County out in Western Massachusetts with opiates. It's the year 2012, right? People are addicted to pills and people are dying and we need the story to be told. So our little local paper in Greenfield, Mass began running this front page story every day for years. And in fact, Franklin County, which is the poorest, most rural county in Massachusetts, is considered really the leader in the state of Massachusetts when it comes to addiction management. Um, and Massachusetts is way ahead of every other state when it comes to addiction management, which for those of us in the field seems pretty sad because we still have a long way to go. So this is the time where I became very involved in this work. And there's no doubt in my mind that pills are on the hook for this epidemic. The original overprescribing of pills in the 1990s into the 2000s definitely started this. Um, when you look at the United States in terms of how many opiates we prescribe, we're far ahead of every other country in the world. Uh, when you look at the deaths from opiate um, overdoses, we have far surpassed gun violence. As bad as gun violence is, we're way past that. We're way past AIDS at the peak of the AIDS epidemic. Right now, we're losing 91 Americans every single day to overdose from opiates. And the problem is that this is the very first um, quarter where it looks like it's slowed down in Massachusetts, but it's still picking up everywhere else in the country. So we're not ahead of this game yet. In spite of all the years of efforts we've put in, we're still not ahead. When you look at the country for overdoses, those red areas are where people are dying. That first map in the top left is 2003. And you just start to watch the country light up from um, overdose deaths. The original sort of highway, I-95, we used to call Oxy Highway, because a lot of the pills that came up here, that came to New England, came out of Florida. And we knew this. We watched this happen in, from 1999 to 2009. We all knew it was happening. And you could take these tour buses down to Florida. You would have a free ride. They'd pay for your motel and all your meals. And all you had to do was to walk into any one of the 600 pain pill mills in Florida. You didn't need to limp. You didn't need a diagnosis. You needed cash. 
And with your cash, you would walk in and you would walk out with a bag full of drugs and a stack of prescriptions, which you would hand to your tour operator, who would then go fill those things and then distribute them on the North Shore and in Maine and New Hampshire and Western Mass and Kentucky, right? That's the way it rolled for a good decade. And then the federal government said to the state of Florida, dudes, you have got to shut this down because you are destroying the eastern seaboard. And if you can't get this under control, we're going to cut off all federal funding to your state. So in the year 2009, nearly every one of the pill mills in Florida was shut down. And 34 doctors went to jail because they were not doctors, even though they appeared to have medical licenses, but they were drug dealers, right? There's no one in their right mind who would think the care they were providing was legitimate medical care. So the problem is, is when you shut down all these pill mills and you have I-95 corridor filled with people struggling with addiction, you got no more source. What are you left with? Yeah, you're left with heroin, right? It's the unintended consequence of cutting off the pills is you're left with a drug that's actually a lot more deadly, right? So heroin was ready, right? It was not, there was no delay between Florida shutting down and heroin being here. The stuff was already on the street, the distribution, there's a great book I'll show you at the end that talks about how the drug is distributed throughout the country. It is incredibly high tech, it's incredibly smart, and no giant wall is gonna be shutting this down anytime soon. Uh, when you ask EMS workers what their number one drug of concern is, those dark green areas, the answer is heroin. What's always amazing to me about this map, then what is up with the southeast? I just said I-95 corridor. Why is the southeast not lighting up as a heroin problem? The answer is this. Those dark purple states are states where there is, on average, between 1 and 1.5 prescribed bottles of opiates per person. So the prescription pattern in New England is really low. I mean. I'm not going to say there's no bad doctors out there who are prescribing huge amounts in Massachusetts, but they're, they're really almost gone. We have basically shut everybody down who was doing bad prescribing. Massachusetts was always a low opiate prescribing state. Did we prescribe too many? Sure we did. I was part of that epidemic, right? But when you look at the states that are still prescribing a ton of opiates, those dark purple states, there are bottles of pills everywhere. You don't need to convert to heroin when you could still buy pills for not much money, right? But when you look at the country in terms of heroin, those red and orange states are heroin. That's us. But if you can imagine those purple states becoming red, think how much more of the country is going to be filled with people struggling with heroin and fentanyl and death by those things. And one of my biggest worries is that in the next five years, as the federal government starts to cut down on prescribing in the entire country, when those purple states become red states, we're going to lose a quarter million Americans. The predictions may be as high as half a million people are going to die from an opiate overdose. So we're still in the beginning of this. Like, I keep wanting to be put out of business. I keep thinking that my job's going to get easier soon. I don't think it's getting easier anytime soon. I'm going to say one more thing that's a little anti-Southern. I'm a deep Massachusetts girl. I was born and raised here. But the South is not filled with police cars carrying Narcan. They're not building methadone clinics in Mississippi. They're not training their recent graduates in how to use medical assisted treatment to help people with addiction. They have no idea what's about to hit them. Yet they should, because all they have to do is look at New England or Kentucky or West Virginia or Ohio and look at our lessons and actually learn from them. OK, so how, what happens to our kids? The truth is our kids are using opiates at very low levels. The days of going into your parents' medicine cabinet and stealing a prescribed opiate, my god, those days sure as heck better be over. If you have a prescription for Vicodin, Percocet, Hydrocodone, Valium, Xanax in your house, if you're not actively using it, in which case it should be under lock and key, whatever bottle you have sitting at your house belongs in a police take back. That is a 2012 message. The fact that in 2000, nearly 18, I still have to say those words, I hope I don't. My hope is that everybody in this room actively use drugs or under lock and key with no access. Any other bottle does not belong in your house anymore. The days of saving a drug for a rainy day, those are behind us. Police have a take back, right? Everybody, you walk in, you dump it, you're done. Somebody gives you, you get your knee done, you get way too many of an oxy prescription, you get rid of it instantly. That's the rule. I think everybody knows that, right? Everybody. We're so beyond that conversation. Consequently, the access that our kids have to opiates, thank God, is really a lot lower. Where do our kids get them? They get injured, right? They're a girl soccer player, they get an ACL tear, it gets reconstructed, they're prescribed an opiate. They get their wisdom teeth out and somehow they're still prescribed an opiate. So who's had wisdom teeth out in the room recently? 
How, oh no, not yourselves, but kids? No, yeah. How much was prescribed for her or him? So here I have a woman who went to the appointment, as most of us would, and said, I will accept no narcotics from you. I need you to tell me how to manage my kid's pain without narcotics. Awesome for you. You did the right thing. I just had, had surgery and got a prescription in the beginning of 20. This was a week ago. Well, let me, so she just said, so she has her arm that's all wrapped up, so something pretty significant happened to her, and she was given a prescription for 20. That's actually a fairly low number because the numbers always used to be 60, so already a positive move has happened. But then she said this other thing, which is, I only used five. So that's a good thing. So I have asked this question of tens of thousands of people now, right? And back in the old days, 2012 and 13, when I asked the question, how much were you prescribed for your root canal or your wisdom tooth, people would routinely say I was given 30 or 40, right? Right, shocking numbers, right? Now, most people are saying, and, the, and we've done statistics statewide on this, on average, most oral surgeons are writing for 60, one six. But when you ask the question, how many did you use, most people's answer is zero, two, four. The most number I ever once heard was six, done. So why isn't everybody prescribing six or fewer? Because that's really what should be prescribed, yeah. So that's an interesting and actually really disturbing thing I've never heard before, which is they're actually giving maybe fewer, but they're upping the dose, or they're giving a more potent drug. So parents have got to pay attention to this, right? This is a parent job, and I did what you did with my kid with oral surgery. The guy knows me. He had his pen above the prescription pad. I was like, you're not going to bother writing me a prescription, right? It's not happening. I know how to manage her pain at home. It's going to be Tylenol and Motrin used together in distraction. And she got through her massive oral surgery. She was fine. Right? So we've got to learn to find ways to manage our pain a little bit better that doesn't always rely on opiates. Some of us have chronic pain and we get great relief from opiates and we are not addicted, right? That's a great thing. But for those of us at high risk and those of us with a developing brain, you want to use as little as you can. If your kid has cancer, you're going to use whatever it takes to help them not suffer, period, end of discussion. This is not a conversation about cancer. This is about surgery. This is about oral surgery, okay? You had a question, yeah? Fascinating, isn't it, right? And in fact, most everything else for chronic pain is not covered by insurance. Things that are proven to help people with chronic pain, acupuncture, massage therapy, chiropractic care. You should have free PT. If you have, with no copay, you have chronic pain conditions, you should be able to go to a physical therapist and not even pay a copay. That would all cost less money than the prescriptions that insurance companies will cover. I don't know if I have any insurance people in the room. I'm always mad at the insurance companies because a lot of us have changed our behaviors. A lot of us have made massive changes in how we function. Insurance companies have done nothing. They have done nothing except limit the number prescribed. They've done nothing to improve um, coverage for people with chronic pain. For those of us who have family members who suffer with chronic pain, it's a terrible disease. And more positive things need to come to people who suffer with chronic pain instead of just prescriptions all the time. Okay, I'm almost done here. Um, if you found, so I'm gonna say this. Um, I look in my kids' rooms. I do not clean their rooms. I do not do their laundry. I walk in their room. I tend to get high blood pressure and I do a lot of yelling, right? But I go through their rooms to look for anything that's concerning to me. So what's concerning to me? Any pill at all. There's no pills in my kids' room. Tylenol, Motrin, Benadryl, what the hell is it doing in here? It does not belong. The kids know the rules. You take a pill, you talk to a parent first. I don't care what it is. You have shin splints from running and your leg is killing you from a field hockey injury, you talk to a parent. Because you know who doesn't know anything about Tylenol, Motrin, Ibuprofen, Advil? Actually, most of us don't, right? It's confusing. Most adults don't understand that Tylenol and ibuprofen are totally distinct drugs that work totally differently in the body, but that ibuprofen, Advil, naproxen, uh, Motrin are actually often the same chemical and they work very similarly. And you can accidentally get way too much of a drug by just not knowing. And your 14-year-old knows zero. So every pill that is swallowed by your kid is, in my opinion, something an adult is overseeing. So no pills in your kid's room. And then I look for stuff that causes me to freak out in my kid's room. I don't want straws in my kid's room. If you're finding a straight edge razor in your kid's room, they're not glazing the windows, my friends, right? <laughs> they're either doing self-harm behaviors or they're actually cutting drugs. That's a problem. When I had a kid who was depressed, I went through his room. I made sure everything possibly sharp, his jackknife, anything I camped with, 
I got everything out. Now, could he still have hurt himself in my house? Yeah, I have kitchen knives, right? But man, you gotta pay attention to what's in your kid's room because when parents bring me in their 22-year-old who's been struggling with addiction, that kid has not been struggling with addiction for two weeks. That kid has been actively cooking and shooting heroin at home in his bedroom for the last three years, right? And I wanna be the parent that figured it out three months in. That's my personal bar. I wanna know my kid is struggling by at least three months, if not sooner because it's a lot easier to help somebody who's in the early part of addiction than it is once they get in deeper. So look in your kid's room. Don't clean them. Don't do their laundry. They're old enough. They should know how to do that stuff. But go through their stuff, because parents will tell me when I flipped the mattress, when I opened the drawers, when I dug underneath the chest of drawers, I found hundreds or thousands of little tiny baggies or those little waxine bags, right? They had no clue it was happening. This is Learn to Cope, which is back there. Learn to Cope is an amazing organization for people who have struggled or suffered. Who wears Learn to Cope in the room? Do I have people here? Yeah, amazing work that is done to help support families struggling with addiction. Um, I can't say enough about the work that is done by Learn to Cope. I stole the slides from them. So Narcan, I've mentioned it several times, naloxone, it's, an, it's a reversal agent for an opiate overdose. Every police cruiser carries it. Am I wrong about that? Everybody carries it. I mean, the school nurse has it though? The school nurse does. But I want to be clear, four years ago, school nurses didn't have it. We were, I was at a conference with the school nurses, and it was just like this, all the school nurses from the state, and I was talking, and I was like, everybody needs Narcan. I can't believe I just said that. But yeah, we're right now, I'm telling you, right now, you have 55 EpiPens at your school, but you have somebody in your school, whether it's a teacher, a staff member, or a kid who likely has an opiate problem, you need to have Narcan in the school. So literally, that night I went home and I wrote the orders and I emailed it out. I said, don't ask anybody, just get it, right? Because I tend to be a little bit of a rule breaker. Some of the nurses were better than me and they went to the school committee and there were arguments, rah, rah, rah. but really, every public school in Massachusetts has Narcan because it's the appropriate thing to do. There's a good semester Samaritan law in Massachusetts, if I stuck Narcan up every nose in this room, you would all be fine, right? If you had a chronic condition that required opiates, you would have some withdrawal, you would be mad at me, but I would cause you no harm. So I carry Narcan in my purse, I carry it in my car. I can usually assess whether somebody has an opiate overdose versus a seizure, right? But you're not going to hurt anybody if you don't know and they're actually seizing. You're not going to harm them by giving them Narcan. So, if you have somebody you love and you need Narcan, it is available without a prescription at every Walgreens and every CVS in the state. It's available at some of the independent pharmacies too and it runs underneath your insurance. So if you have somebody you love who you're worried about, you should have Narcan. Learn to Cope trains people on how to use Narcan and they also give Narcan out. Um, what does it take to get better? I'm almost done, I have a couple more slides. So. Um, it's complicated how to get better with addiction. I told you the brain breaks, the dopamine gets um, misappropriated and gets really decreased. But what it takes to get better with addiction is time. That's what it takes. If I can like, shoot everybody to the moon for two years, they're way better. They just are, right? They're miserable, they're sad, they miss their friends. But I can make them better if I get them out of wherever and I put them in a bubble. But what it takes to get better is complicated, right? To get better, you need sober, stable housing 100% of the time. If you're going back to a house where somebody is actively using, you will not get better. It's not possible. And the access in this state and around the country to long-term sober living is miserable, right? You can get into a detox. There's plenty of detox beds in Massachusetts now. There just are, right? But the next step and then the next step and then the 90 days and the 180 days and living somewhere for a year and a half, find me those spots. We do not have enough. When one wants to come to your neighborhood, when a sober structured living wants to show up in your neighborhood, please show up at the city hall and say, this is a good thing. This is good for our community. This is good for our kids. Don't block it. You need these places to exist. So what else does it take to get better? Having a sense of purpose, having a job, taking care of a pet, falling in love, going back to school, getting treatment for your mental health disorder, right? Having insurance. It takes a whole bunch of things to get better. Um, medical treatment for addiction, for heroin addiction, um, I am a big believer in it. I use methadone clinics all the time. I've been a prescriber of buprenorphine, also known as Suboxone, for 16 or 17 years, I use it in my treatment center, I use naltrexone, I use whatever it takes to help stabilize people, but it is not one route to recovery. It's not just going to 90 meetings in 90 days. You need a whole host of things to fall your way. And it's hard, right? If you don't have one of those things, it becomes a lot harder. Okay, so these are great books on addiction. Lots of you have read these books on already. Um, and again, you're gonna take the slide deck, but you can also just take a smartphone picture of this. Who's read any of these books? What did you guys read? Which one? 
Gabor Mate. So that is a, what do you do for work? Are you, you're a clinician. You're a high school guy. I knew you were, I knew she was in, in the field. So um, Gabor Mate in the realm of hungry ghosts is a family doctor in Canada who takes care of a lot of people with addiction. He's a beautiful writer. That's one of my all time favorite books. I love him uh, and like all of his writing. Who's read um, Beautiful Boy? Is that what you read, Beautiful Boy? You read most of them, yeah. Beautiful Boy? In Chasing the Scream. These are great books for parents. Beautiful Boy is a, a beautifully written book about a dad who watches his son um, struggle with a really serious addiction for a really long time. It's painful as a parent to read, but all of these books are beautifully written. My favorite book up there is The Body Keeps the Score. That is the book that talks about trauma and what trauma does to the human body. And if you are anything, if you are a teacher, a police officer, a nurse, a, a counselor of any sort, that book changed my life. That book changed how I was as a doctor more than anything I've read in the last 20 years. So that is a beautiful book. My husband read it, he's also a doctor, and it changed him too. So that's the body keeps the score. I'm gonna come back to the slide. So I have a website now. My kid built me a website because my life got really out of control. And so my videos are on this website. I can't put slide decks on the website because it won't, it's too big a document, it's a huge document. Um, but um, there's a bunch of articles, there's a bunch of other stuff on that website if anybody ever wants that. But I'm gonna leave right there. So yeah, it's ruthpotee.com is it's the website. So what other questions do people have? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. So first of all, I'm gonna say the preventive community has already been doing that work. They've been doing that work for the last 10 or 15 years, the delay conversation. They have moved away from this just say no campaign. That, I mean, we know that was a failed campaign because it didn't tell the truth, right? It just didn't. And I'm a big believer when you give kids information, they make good decisions. That's the reason a talk like this I actually think works for kids. They hear the data, they want to know the information, they make better decisions. And that, what, that is what the prevention community now does. And you saw that chart that showed that use of everything has gone down. Right, again, the use of, there's no substance, including marijuana, that has actually gone up. It's, marijuana's flat at this point. It's, it may go up, because it's gone up in, in Colorado. So I actually think kids respond to the information of the fact that if you expose the brain while developing, it is a setup for disease. And if I said to the average adolescent, whatever, if you, and I'm not saying this is what I say, but if you can imagine this, if you simply never eat the set of foods you will never have adult obesity, right? If I said that, many 15-year-old girls would be like, okay, I will avoid Cheez-Its and orange food dye or whatever. They will easily jump onto that plan. Most kids don't wanna be addicted to something. They have no interest. A lot of them have family members who are addicted. Like, they often don't wanna go there. They just need the information. So I guess my response is I believe when you educate kids about the information that you all now know, I think they often make good decisions. And again, our kids are making good decisions. They really are. You need to go home and pat your normative kid on the back and remind them what a great job they're doing because the other ones shout them out so much of the time. But I think your question is a really good one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's your sense in the room because I don't know the last time you guys stood in front of an auditorium full of kids, it's terrifying. So that is my sense in the room, right? I walk out of every high school talk feeling demoralized and miserable. That's how I feel. But then I get the data later. So here's an example. I talked to a group of kids. There were 1,800 kids in this auditorium somewhere south of here. And it was the week before the ballot measure, okay? Uh, in November, it was that week. And I, was, I left that talk thinking, if those kids had had tomatoes, they would have thrown them at me because there was this loud crowd in the back, the pro-marijuana kids, who were so obnoxious, right? The superintendent was standing up multiple times. I was like, no, I got this, I got this. But it became a very rowdy crowd, right? So I left thinking, boy, that was a total failure. I hate talking to teenagers. And the next day after the election, they called me and said, we had our own ballot here in the school in marijuana, legalization of marijuana by vote of the high school students failed 80% to 20%. And this was a group whose strong sense going in was of course the teenagers were gonna vote for it. So my point is, is I actually left thinking, you know what, those kids did hear me. But what you heard me say to you is I too am impacted by the loud crowd in the corner. It impacts me as a speaker. But the truth is most kids walk out of the room having learned stuff, they've practiced a sentence coming out of their mouth when they're first offered marijuana or alcohol that says, I'm not interested, I'm an athlete, right? One of the things I didn't show you is it slows, I show it to the kids, it slows down your response time. It's why you're a terrible driver when you're high on weed. You're really slow, but you're still a terrible driver. 
but this slow response time, there's no sport. What is the sport where it's good to have a slow response time? Maybe there is one. Tai Chi, right? Maybe that's a good one that you could be high on, but most other sports, it's not good to be slow in your response time. So my point is, I think the kids actually do hear the message. I really do. Yes. There's tons of data on that. So what's confusing, and the question you're asking is media psychosis and earlier um, schizoaffective disorder is what we're seeing with marijuana. So the, the data's complicated, though, because we're not seeing a doubling of the rates of diagnosis of schizophrenia in Colorado. We're seeing an earlier onset, right? And are we, are we creating disease that may never have been there? I don't know that. It's definitely being kicked in a lot faster while the brain is developing. Is that good or bad? It's all bad. I don't know who's worked in emergency rooms in Colorado. In this room, probably not. But the emergency rooms in Colorado are chock-a-block full with marijuana. And it's a really frustrating thing in an emergency room because you're really busy and you should be taking care of gunshot wounds and acute appendicitis. And instead, you have acutely psychotic people for whom you can do nothing who are absorbing hundreds and hundreds of bays in an emergency room. The Denver airport has this whole thing where they, you come up to the counter and you're high as a kite and they're like, you're too high to fly. You don't get to get on the airplane. Like the flight attendants say this, the ticket agents say this, everybody knows what too high to fly looks like. And then they put you in an ambulance and they just ship you over to whatever the local hospital is and you just get sober there. It's a very unpleasant thing. You've lost your ticket. No one's going to refund that ticket. You just spent the night in the emergency room. So there's very good data that looks at earlier onset of mania, psychosis, and, and schizophrenia. But is the incidence truly higher? I don't know yet. I don't know. We don't know. We're going to see, we're going to see this whole thing unfold together in the next 20 years. That's the problem. I don't know anything about the gender specific. There's, you know, psychosis and schizophrenia is higher in males in general. So that will skew things a little bit. Um, but so I don't know. But guess what? We're all going to start figuring this out together. I'm sad to say that part. And again, I don't think a lot of it's going to be positive. There's some predictions that the opiate epidemic, people getting addicted to opiates will get lower because they're too busy with the couch lock and playing their video games with their high weed use. Maybe that will be better. I don't know. Um, so when you looked at Colorado, which legalized marijuana in, I think, 2012, there was a big spike in teenage use of marijuana, right? And they call Denver the Mile High City because it has the highest rates of teenage marijuana use in the country. The problem is that they came out with new statistics that said there isn't an increase in marijuana like three years ago. And then we went back and looked at the statistics and said, that's not true. That conflicts with other data. The problem is they dropped out Denver and um, Oh, there's one other county where the use is really high that's just escaped me. They, they scooted that out of the data collection, which wasn't so helpful when you're paying attention to it. There are actually big regions of Colorado where marijuana use is not high, where they've actually basically banned it. But in, it, has anybody been to Colorado recently? Yeah, what did you see? You could smell marijuana everywhere? Were you in, in Denver? You could smell marijuana everywhere. Right. Boulder and Denver, there are more, more pot shops than there are McDonald's, Starbucks, and every other coffee shop put together. There are blocks where there are two marijuana dispensaries on a single block. It is hard to walk down the streets of Boulder and, or Denver and not smell pot. I have to say, for me, it's not a state I'm going to go to anytime soon. It, it actually is a real turnoff for me to be, bring my kids there and go hiking if I have to walk around Boulder and smell weed and talk about it a lot. And, uh, but so yeah, there are big spikes in the open states, but you know what, there's some open states that have done it differently. So um, the way that DC did it is DC said you can grow your own. There's no stores, there's none of the sugar-filled gummy worms, but you can grow a certain number of plants at home, done. Right? It was actually one way to approach it, right? The way that Washington State did it is very highly regulated. It has a very specific limit of what, how much THC is allowed to be sold. You can't sell it in the forms that are addicting kids. So they came in and said, yeah, we'll do it, but we're going to regulate, 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 done. So I, um, the rates of spiking there have not looked the same. Colorado was the first one out of the barn, and they had not real regulation. But again, what we passed in this state was even further than what Colorado did. What we passed was insane. And unless this cannabinoid commission reigns it in, and they have a lot of influence not to rein it in, 
it's going to look like this. So if Ipswich wants several dispensaries in town, you're going to have them, guaranteed. You guys are right across the border, which means that you guys are going to get targeted by New Hampshire. This is a prime spot to sell pot. And the only way you can stop it, in my recollection, I don't know all the rules, you have to have a town-wide referendum. If you were a town who voted for it, it has to be a town-wide vote to vote against it. If you are a town that voted against it, then the school, what is it called here? You guys have a town council, a select board? The select board and towns that voted against it can just vote it down. But if you were a town that voted for it, the whole town has to vote against it. It's complicated. Yeah, uh, so let me go in the way back and then I'll go there again. Yep. Yep. Oh. Yeah, video games. Internet? Uh-huh. So here's a dad who's trying to figure out how to get ahead of your kids on technology when your kids are ahead of you on technology most of the time. That's the problem. That's what you're describing. And I think a lot of us will agree that uh, the devices or video games can be addictive. Who thinks that's true? Absolutely, right? They have compulsive use. They have continued use despite harm, right? I mean, the harm is huge. Like, you're going to be ticked off at them. They're starting to not do it school well at school. It meets all definition of addiction. And you're doing everything you can to get ahead of them, yet that little guy of yours is wicked smart, and he's getting ahead of you. Yeah. Well, you know what's killing me is that I'm in a room full of smart people and we still can't get on top of this. It should be so easy. We should be able to flip a switch in our house and all of their devices power down to nothing, right? It should be so easy and instead it is really hard. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, Comcast does have one. I just, I have a... That's right. That's right. It's, it should be so much easier than it is, right? It, it, but again, this is, you know, it's in their best interest to get their kids addicted too. It's in everybody's best interest to get them addicted. That game that's stealing all your money, it's in their interest for your kid to be addicted. Great. They're promoting it, yeah, right, it's a real problem. And maybe that will prevent your kid from getting hooked on Oxy, uh, maybe, I don't know, but none of it is good, right? You want your kid out exercising, you want them to be doing yoga with you, you want them walking the dog and cleaning their room and getting their homework right done, right? You want all of these things and instead they're on their screen, it's so maddening. So let me maybe take one other question, and then I, or a couple other questions, because you guys are, so let me go, let me go back there and there, yeah. Well, there's that, you're going to take my slide deck, so all of the, so we remember, the way things get studied in the United States of America involves federal funding, right? If you're running a big study, you need millions of dollars, and the only way to get millions of dollars is through the federal government, and you cannot study marijuana because it's a Schedule One drug, so that's a real problem that you can't study it. That's a good book. This book says that he's from um, McLean, I think. He's from McLean. Will you turn it around so she can see it? That's a good book. He's local. He's from McLean. He talks and writes a lot about it. He, he will cite all of these same studies, Australia, New Zealand, um, but the problem in this country is we cannot study it until it becomes not a Schedule One drug. And that's one of Obama's failures in my mind is he did not make it a Schedule Two drug, which would have allowed us to study it. Right now, the only marijuana you can study in the country is the stuff that is grown on the federal marijuana plantation in Mississippi, which is like 2% THC. That's not what our kids are using. It's not what needs to be studied. The other thing about marijuana is marijuana is not one thing. It's 400 different plants and different strains. It's going to be incredibly complicated to study. I showed you those pictures. You'd have to study kids using cannabinoid hashish under the tongue at 70% versus 40%. Like, it's not like studying Prozac. So these are complicated things to study. I know what I know, which is when you look at the brain development and when you look at where the receptors are impacted, this is bad for our kids' brains. And at this point, knowing how much we don't know, I think we can say that much. And remember, we're fighting this giant tide of our kids saying it's all good. So the chasm between what we think we know and what they know is enormous. That's our problem, is the chasm. Yeah. Yeah.
Yep. Yep. I think you should. So when I moved out to where I live now, I moved from Boston. I, I, I live where I grew up. Um, so I, I'm familiar with rural. And I remember being with one of my friends, and she said, you've got to ask people if they have guns. And I thought to myself, God, I've never thought about that, right? But the truth is, I live in a rural area where there is a lot of hunting. And I actually, I would really want to know if guns were under lock and key at somebody else's house. They, I don't have any guns at my house. But it occurred to me I'd never thought about asking that. So first of all, marijuana stores are not yet open in Massachusetts. There should not be any marijuana candy available because it's illegal to bring it to the state from another state. That's trafficking. It's a federal violation. But, but starting next summer, yes, I think you should ask that question. I think that is very reasonable. And I ask my question of adults where my kids are going, I ask them about alcohol. I say, will there be any alcohol consumption at your house under your surveillance? Because then, first of all, it's illegal to do that. I give them a long lecture, and my kid will not be going to that party. And I ask how much supervision there is. Uh, but I think, yeah, I think that if you have a kid and that's a concern starting next summer, we're going to have to ask that question. Is there somebody in your house who is using pot candy? Some kids at my school um, just got suspended because their grandmother had pot brownies. She has a condition. She has a, you know, a cannab her cannabinoid um, certificate, it's all legitimate, but the kids knew they were in the freezer, helped themselves to the entire pan of brownies, which had like 150 servings in it, because one brownie you break up into seven bits. Those kids were actively psychotic and ended up in the emergency room, and they got suspended. And the truth is, like, that grandmother, she needed to, she, those things should have been under lock and key. Do you lock a freezer? That freezer you should have locked, is what I will say. I would not have had a teenager in my house with pot brownies in the freezer, right? And she's getting prosecuted. Is that good or bad? It is what it is. So let's see over here, yeah. Yep, facility, yep. Yeah, so um, I live in a part of the state that had not a single detox when I moved there, and we needed a detox. We, haven't, we hadn't had a place where people could go who needed addiction care. And they asked me years ago, would I be the medical director? I was like, I got a thousand jobs, I can't do it. And then they came to me and said, we don't have a medical director and we can't open. And then I was like, oh my God, you gotta be kidding me. So I work like 80 hours a week because I have all these jobs all over the place doing this, this kind of addiction work. And when I went there, I said, we're not doing a detox. I don't believe in detox. Yanking the drug out of a brain and shooting people back to the street in seven days is a spin dry that puts them at risk of death. Detox is an old word that should never be used. I am appalled by it. We will do no detox. Patients can choose their pathway. If they really are here just to like yank themselves out and they want to use again, then I have that conversation. I'm like, you're here for a spin dry. Let's talk about Narcan. Let's, let me call your mom and talk to her about Narcan because your risk of dying is really high. If you really want to engage in treatment, let's do that instead, right? So what do we do instead? And we're the only ones in the state doing it, but now the state is mandating that everybody do it. So we do straight inductions to methadone. I do straight inductions to buprenorphine. I hold on to them for a really long time, and I get them the Vivitrol shot. Um, so I get them stable on medicine with a warm handoff to a community provider. This is for opiate addiction. That's what we do. With alcohol, I use a lot of meds for alcohol because when I have people who are there for the fifth or sixth or eighth time this year with terrible alcohol use disorder, I'm telling you, going to 90 meetings in 90 days isn't working for them. And then I throw at them any medicine I can that might stick, including things that are so not FDA approved, but I think won't harm them and may get them some traction. So I use a lot of drugs, not because I shill for the pharmaceutical industry, but because I'm trying to prevent people from dying. So we do straight inductions, methadone clinics, suboxone treatment, or I get them the Vivitrol shot. We stabilize them. Our AMA rates are incredibly low. People feel a lot better when they're not withdrawing. And we think we're having a lot of success getting people stable in treatment. So that's what we do. So the poli police chief or police officer here, and then I'll do you next. I don't know. You, the, I'm promoting you to chief. You're welcome. Yep, but it's, so with the way we think about it, I, again, I hate detox. I talk about the first step. Your first step is to get medically stable enough that you could get your breathing back and get your brain like a tiny bit functional. And then there's the next step, which is likely closer to 30 days. And then there's the third step, which is likely 90 days. And then really you need structured long-term sober living, which is really a year or a year and a half. So I think of it as a stepwise approach. And I'm trying to keep you stable 
and, and treat your trauma issues and get your mental health disorders addressed and get your skin healed and drain all your abscesses, all these things along the way of you getting better, right? And we need to be, right now, what we really have is stuff that covers people for maybe 15 days, right? That's what we have. And the other things, we have very few options. I have to say, Essex County has some of the least available treatment in the entire state. When you look at the map of the state, this county has very little treatment. Yep, and then they die. That's exactly right. But ask yourself, tell me what 90-day, 180-day programs you guys have locally. Do you have them? You need them. We all desperately need them. And again, the map of Essex County, you have as big a problem as everybody else has, right? There's nobody who gets off the hook in the state. Everybody has a problem, except Essex County has the least available treatment in the entire state. And I don't know why. I don't know why. There's some, I mean, I have to say your local hospitals have not risen to this occasion. I get to say that partly because I'm a doctor. who I get to throw doctors under the bus all day long, and I'm happy to do that. But I've been to Gloucester Hospital. I've been to, um, what's the hospital in Newburyport? I've been to Anna Jake's. I've been to these places. You know what the treatment is if you're pregnant and you have an opiate addiction in your county? It stinks. It does. It stinks. It shouldn't stink. It's good in my tiny, tiny county. It should be good here. It's not, there's no excuse for it. People need to, people, doctors need to do their damn jobs. We have a massive problem. Learn your stuff, get trained, and do your job, and take care of the sick and the suffering, right? Well, so it takes, it takes advocacy. It's sort of a learn to cope kind of level and, and local elected officials that say, it, and people who are in recovery, that's who makes these things work. But it really, some of the state, there's state funding for this kind of thing. There's all this language for state funding that I know nothing about. There's a TSS, that's a 90 to 180 day program that gets state funded. Um, and, but just having well-structured, sober living houses that are run by people who know what they're doing. I mean, there are a lot of people in this room who could run a sober living house. You could, I mean, you'd, it, you know, you'd have to be firm. You'd have to urine drug screen. You'd have to make sure that so-and-so's little brother who you know is actively struggling actually doesn't come to visit. You have to search people's belongings. There's a little bit that feels like a police state, but you're trying to keep people safe. And then in a perfect world, what would you provide for them, right? You'd have plenty of therapy, plenty of exercise. The place would have three therapy dogs and a cat. You would be growing things in your back garden. You'd have a chicken coop that would be giving eggs to the local food pantry. You would be doing things that would give people a sense of purpose, right? You can imagine in a perfect world the place that you guys would build, right? And it would be good. And these things exist, but it takes some resources and money. But I could tell you, the cost of not treating costs 20 times more. The cost of these guys rescuing people overdose after overdose, a single case of endocarditis which is, is an infection of a heart valve, that's really, I don't know, it's 150,000 bucks, right? Hep C treatment in this country is still running about $90,000. Hep C treatment, everybody who uses IV drugs has Hep C, right? You know what I could do with $90,000 to help you get better? A lot, right? So I have to say, this county has a lot of a lot of ways to go in terms of improving access to long-term living. Look, you guys have been lovely. I could spend all night with you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.